talking, we've been talking about journeying with the challenging. I'm sure wherever we go, whichever home we go to, whichever company we are in, whichever neighborhood we live in, there are always bound to be challenging people that we have to interact with. And sometimes, if you're honest to yourself, when you get a chance, stand in front of the mirror, you'll probably be looking at the most challenging person in the mirror. And this is further complicated when we have a wrong perspective of what Christians are supposed to be like. Very often, because of the standards in the Bible and because of the commandments, we see Christians as a work that has been perfected. We are God's masterpiece, perfect masterpieces. And therefore, Christians must be Christ-like now at this moment. The moment they pray the sinner's prayer, they are transformed into perfection. However, that is totally untrue. The truth is, we are all work in progress. God has not finished with us yet. The implication of such a statement, the implication of such a truth is that Christians still have weaknesses. Any one of you back to defer? Any perfect people in our midst? Okay, no. And therefore, we'll make mistakes. And so, it is important for us to have this right perspective because this right perspective will lead us to the right responses and establish the right culture, the right environment where we can welcome all and sundry to be part of this congregation and make them feel at home. This will be a place where they can plant their roots. This will be a place where they can rise up and grow and participate in serving one another and be a servant of God. And so, because we have the right perspective, you will lead us to have the right responses. We can be patient, we can be loving, we can be gentle and establish a right culture or right environment. And so today we want to go further and look at this. How can we really be the instrument that shows kindness, be the instrument that shows love and gentleness to those who are difficult, to those who are challenging, to those who have a tendency to step on your toes, to those who are a pain in your neck. What we need to do is, of course, to enlarge our capacity. But what kind of capacity do we need to enlarge? What kind of capacity do we need to enlarge? We need to at least enlarge in the area of the right perspective. We need to think correctly. We need to see correctly. You're probably asking, haven't you talked about that? The right perspective is we are all work in progress and therefore we have weaknesses and we'll make mistakes. Yes, that is true. We already have the right perspective. But do we really know? Do we really understand this perspective and the implications of this perspective? Do we really know? Okay. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 gives us a good example of what we think we know and what we truly know. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 says, He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tashish. We all know that God wanted to send Jonah to Nineveh. But instead of going the direction of Nineveh, he went down to Joppa, got into the boat and fled to Tashish. And then he said, I knew, I knew, past tense, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love and a God who relents from sending calamity. So Joshua, sorry, Jonah was sent to the people of Nineveh in order to preach to them. And what happened was, he decided to run away, but he got caught in the belly of the fish. He repented and God sent him to Nineveh. He walked into the city, preached something like eight words, and the whole city, hundreds of thousands of them, all got converted and they repented, including the animals. What a great revival! 
This was the greatest revival that ever took place in the Old Testament. I'm sure when we all hear of such a great revival, we will all rejoice, we will all be happy, we will all be excited, especially when you know that God is such a compassionate God, one who is abounding in love, and now His love is manifested and people all turn to Him. That is great news, wonderful news, isn't it? But look at how Jonah responded. He said, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's like, huh? He knows, but does he really know? You see, brothers and sisters, there are different levels of understanding, different depths of knowledge. Some of us we know in our mind, but we don't really know it in our hearts. For example, if we know people will make mistakes because they're all work in progress, when they make mistakes, it is normal. And if it is normal, when they make mistakes, you should say things like, oh, ah, okay, lah. normal. This is the kind of reaction for something that is normal. Most of the times, normal things happen. That's why they are called normal. But very often, our reaction doesn't show that we truly understand this is normal. Because when people make mistakes, our face screwed up, our eyes shut, our jaws drop and say, Huh? How can you do that? How can you do something like that? No! We get upset, we get angry, we get stressed. Brothers and sisters, if that is normal, can you imagine how often you are stressed, how often you are upset, how often you are angry, how often you are frustrated? The reason is because we don't really know as we ought to know. So brothers and sisters, there are different depths of knowledge. And so when I talk about enlarging our capacity, it's going deeper in our understanding of what it means to be work in progress. What it means that we are Christians, but we still have weaknesses and we will make mistakes. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32 says this, To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, New King James Version says, Abide in my word, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if you look at verse 32, it says, If you hold on to my teaching. So first of all, we have Jesus' teaching. Before you can hold on to His teaching, you must know His teaching, correct? How can you hold on to His teaching? How can you abide in His teaching? How can you follow? How can you live in His teaching until you know what His teaching is? And so to know His teaching, we must at least have a certain understanding of His teaching. Then he goes on to say, if you hold on to my teaching, you will know the truth. So the first thing we know his teaching, but as a result of putting his teaching into practice, we come and we access or we discover another kind of knowledge, the knowledge of his truth. And that is the kind of knowledge that we truly want because this is the knowledge that will set us free. This is the knowledge that will make the difficult easy. This is the knowledge that will make the tough simple. This is the knowledge that will make Christian life enjoyable. So, knowing His teaching is not the same as holding on to His teaching. I want to explain to you what I see as the different depths or different aspects of knowledge. There are at least four of them. The first part is to remember, to recall. To remember or to recall is to discover the facts. What is it that we are supposed to know? To, 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 to identify uh, the, the approach, to identify what is the topic that we are studying, what we're looking at. And then after that, we need to understand it. We need to understand. To understand is to link the relevant facts together. How it fits together to form a particular paradigm. What are the implications? It is like knowing where all the different parts of the jigsaw puzzle is supposed to go. We are able to explain, or at least we know, what fits in and what does not. 
And for spiritual truth, we need a spiritual tutor. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 16, verse 13, that when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, that is the Holy Spirit, He will guide us into all truth. And so what we need to understand, to know this teaching, we need to know it on two parts. Number one, we need to be able to at least repeat it. We need to be able to share it with others. And then we need to understand it, how it all comes together. But that's not all. The reason why that is not all is because James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. As Christians, if all we have is just the mental or the cognitive understanding of His Word, then we are deceived because that knowledge is still not full knowledge. So what else do we need to do? We need to do the third thing. We need to abide in the Word, to live in the Word, to hold on to the Word. To hold on to the Word, to live in the Word, to abide in the Word means to do it, don't just listen to it. Don't just stop at being able to repeat it. Don't just stop at being able to teach it because you understand it, but you must go further, you must do it, you must put it into action. And then after you put it into action, you'll probably be doing this repeatedly. The more you put it into action, you understand it a little bit more, you remember it a little bit better, and then you put it into action, and then you remember a little bit more, you put it into, you understand it better. And so this thing goes round and round, and it goes round and round many times. Until one day, you do it so often, you are abiding in it, you are practicing it, you do it over and over again, it becomes habitual, it becomes a practice, it becomes part of your life. And that's when the freedom, that's when the power come. So, let's use this paradigm or let's use these four different aspects to see how we can build a culture that embraces people even when they make mistakes. So what does people who make mistakes need the most? When you make a mistake, what do you want the people around you to do for you? What is your most immediate need? What is your greatest need when you make mistake? What do you think? It's a bit hard to shout out your answer when you have the mask on. So I'm just asking you this question for you to think about it. And I'm going to offer you an answer. When people make mistakes, the one thing that they want most to hear from the words of the person that they've offended is, it's okay. You are forgiven. It's all right. No problem. It's okay. This is how God approaches this problem. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so we have already mentioned this the previous time when I preached, looking at verse 15 and verse 16. The context is when someone has made a mistake. And God says to them, look, you have a high priest who was tempted in every way just as you are. He went through it all. He can sympathize, he can empathize with your weaknesses. He can feel the same way you feel. He understands your struggle. And when you come, you can come boldly, you can come confidently, because when you come, you're going to get mercy. Mercy, are you here tonight? You, there's a sister by the name of Mercy in our church, in our congregation. You know, mercy, you're going to get mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is the waiving of punishment for the things that have been done wrong. It is forgiveness. God says, it is okay. And so the first thing that God wants to offer us when we make mistakes, when we come to Him, is forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, 
just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And so just as how God forgives us, He also wants us to forgive one another. And so the first thing that we need to do and we need to understand in order to build this community that will accept people who are works in progress is this aspect of forgiveness or in one word, mercy. That they may receive mercy that we can be kind and compassionate to them. The word compassionate comes from the Greek word splachna, which means bowels. It is translated as tender-hearted. It's also translated as mercies. Can you imagine when you have made mistakes and you come to a group of people, they're all non-judgmental. They don't want to condemn you. They're not interested in punishing you. But all that they want to do is to forgive you, is to embrace you, is to support you so that you can move on to your next station in life. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Don't you want to be in a community like that? Of course we do. So where do we start? We start from the top, from trying to identify what is this aspect, how do we go about doing it, what do we need to know? What do we need to discover? What do we need to understand? So first of all, let us start by looking at how merciful God is to us. We forgive just as God has forgiven us. But how has God forgiven us? Luke chapter 7, verse 47 says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been for forgiven little, loves little. The context of this particular sentence is the sinful woman who went to visit Jesus at Simon's the Pharisee's house. She was the prostitute of the town. Everybody knew her. And the most difficult place for a sinner to enter into is to enter into a place where everybody thinks they are holy. Whether they are holy or not, that's another matter. But they think they are holy. Can you imagine the eyes of insult, the eyes of judgment that is piercing through that woman? But the woman couldn't be bothered. The woman came in. You know what he did? He stood behind Jesus, started weeping. And of course, by now, everybody is looking at her because she is causing such a scene. And after she has wept buckets because it's big enough to wet Jesus' feet, then she uses, let her hair down, uses her hair to cleanse Jesus' feet and then anoint Jesus' feet with the alabaster uh, uh, jar of perfume which is a very expensive item. Reportedly, it is worth probably a year's wages. So if they did not see her coming in, they did not hear her sobbing and weeping, by now, they must have smelled the perfume. Everybody's attention will be upon her. Why did, this do, why did she do such a thing and attract so much attention? Especially when all these are condemning attention, they started to ask this question to one another, doesn't Jesus know who this woman is? If he knew, he would not have allowed her to do so. But why was this woman willing to go through so much shame and pay such a great price to demonstrate this extravagant love? The answer is, brothers and sisters, because she felt that she has been forgiven much. This sentence, she, her, sins, her many sins have been forgiven for she loved much, does not make love the cause of her forgiveness, but rather it is the proof of it. Because somehow, in an interaction with Jesus, she felt that she has been forgiven so much, so naturally, there is an overflowing of love 
towards Jesus and the people around her. And so if you want to grow, if you want to expand your capacity to show mercy to the people who sin against you, who step on your toes, who are pain in your neck, is to look at how much Jesus has been merciful to you. Because the one who has been forgiven much will love much. The one who has been forgiven little loves little. So the more you see how much Jesus loves you, how much Jesus has forgiven you, it will enlarge your capacity to forgive others. Then we look at the parable. I'm going to look at two parables and then we will end. The parable of the unforgiving servant. You know, this evening when uh, Jacob was leading worship, I was reflecting, I was going through how I'm going to present the sermon. And I got to this passage and I was just working through this passage in my mind. And man, I was so blown by Jesus' mercy to each and every one of us. You know the story, how it started? Jesus came to Peter, kind of proud. He said, Jesus, how many times must we forgive our neighbour or forgive those who have sinned against us? And he offered this answer seven times, isn't it? Normally, in the Old Testament, you're only required to forgive up to three times. And so he doubled it plus one, seven times. So that's pretty good, right? And Jesus answered him, no, not seven times. It is 70 times seven. And so Jesus is trying to tell him, Peter, you really have to forgive. You have to forgive so much that you must make forgiving your lifestyle. Mercy must be part of your nature and character. And then he tells the story of this unforgiving servant. You know how much this servant owes the master? 10,000 talents. So he begged the master and the master decided, forgive him, wipe off 10,000 talents. And then he goes after this person who owes him, who owes him 100 denarii. When he re the person was not able to pay, he got him arrested, put him into prison and beat him up. When people heard about this, this was such an anomaly that they reported to the master. The master got very upset and said this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 32 and 33. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? You see, why did the master react in such a way? Why did the people who reported him react in such a way? Because after you have received such great show or great demonstration of mercy, it is only natural you show the same kind of mercy or at least a portion of that mercy to others. How much was he forgiven? 10,000 talents. How much did this guy owe him? 100 denarii. You know how much is a talent compared to a denarii? One talent is 6,000 denarii. Just imagine uh, this person works and he gets paid 100 ringgit a day. 100 denarii is the salary he gets for 100 days. And that is equivalent to something like uh, 10,000 ringgit. You know what is 10,000 talents? 10,000 talent is like 6 billion ringgit. Suddenly, you receive a windfall of 6 billion ringgit and you run after this poor guy who owes you only $10,000. It doesn't make sense because Jesus is trying to communicate to Peter you know why you must forgive 70 times 7? Peter is like this, this servant who refused to let go the 100 denarii. And so, he said, because you don't understand, you don't comprehend how much mercy you have already received, how much you have already been forgiven. Brothers and sisters, think about this. If we do a direct comparison... Peter is like us. We ask Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. 
And so the 70 times 7 is like the 100 denarii that he should forgive. And this is something that he ought to do because he has been forgiven the 10,000 talent debt that he owes to the master. And so I was just worshipping God and singing the song as Jacob was leading. And then I'm thinking, you know, all the things that people owe me, the debt that people owe me, the wrongs that they do to me, if I were to put it in, th- in monetary terms, it's only like 10,000. But you know, the offences that I've made against God is worth something like 6 billion ringgit. It is a debt I cannot pay. As I was worshipping God, I saw how rich and how great and how wonderful God's mercy is. When you have received a $6 billion gift, do you think it is hard to let go a $10,000 debt? Of course not. Then, lastly, give me a bit of time, the parable of the prodigal son. I should not take more than five or six minutes. But the story of the prodigal son, it starts off this way in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came and asked Jesus, why does this man eat dinner with the servants, with the tax collectors? Because in their view, these are the challenging and troublesome people. Jesus should not have anything to do with them. But Jesus went on to tell them three parables, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the, lo- parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. And especially in the parable of the lost son, we know how this son went to the father and took his share of property. And then he wasted it on while living. In the words of the elder brother, this while living is spending money on prostitutes. He basically wasted away his father's hard-earned money. And now he decided to come back to the father not because he misses the father, but because he was in a desperate situation. He has spent all his money. He has no money left to buy food. That place has fallen into famine. Now, as a Jew, he has to work among non-kosher animals, which is the pig. And what is worse is that the food that was meant for the pigs, was palatable to him. He was even tempted to eat the food that was meant for the pigs. Can you see how desperate and how hungry he was? And because of that, he says, I better go back to my father. And of course, after he had done such great wrong, how can he just walk back to the father, right? So he must think of a good reason. He must put in a good act. And so in verse 18, he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so in his mind is, I'm going back. My focus is get some food. I'm no longer worthy. I cannot go back to become the son. I just want to be a hired person. And that was his attitude as he go back. You know, brothers and sisters, very often when we sin against God, we are also afraid to come back to God because we feel we are so sore, we are so dirty, we are so unworthy. But look at the perspective of the father. He came back. He didn't even get a chance to finish his sentence. And then the father said to him, to his servant, say, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Totally different from the son's prediction, from the son's assumption of how the father would respond. Instead of a time where he gets interrogated, condemned and punished, he's probably thinking, I've got two choices. Get scolded, get punished and get food or stay here, get hungry and die. And so he decided it's better to go back. But the result was so unexpected 
the result was so different. Because in the father's mind, this guy has always been my son and I have forgiven him. Brothers and sisters, can you see the glorious forgiveness of God? Especially when we have such a great sin in the background. So what we need to do, brothers and sisters, after we understand, if you don't understand, pray that God gives you wisdom, God gives you revelation, so that you can understand the greatness of God's mercy and forgiveness. And the first thing that you need to do after that understanding is to experience it for yourself. Experience it. So are you able to accept God's forgiveness? When you come to God, even after you sin, do you come to God boldly or do you come to God in fear and in trembling? Yes, we all come to God in fear and trembling because God is such a great God. But it's not because He's going to strike us dead. The son, prodigal son, thought it was going to be like that. But instead, they had a party. That is why Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Come boldly to the throne of grace. It is the throne of grace. It is not the throne of punishment. It is not the throne of condemnation. It is not the throne of judgment. It is the throne of grace. Look at the mercy, the parable of the unforgiving servant. What he forgave the servant was 10,000 talents, equivalent to 6 billion ringgit. Just wipe off with a stroke of a pen. That no wonder the Bible tells us in Ephesians, can you imagine the love that has been lavished upon us? Second question in the application is, are you able to forgive yourself? When I counsel certain people after they make serious mistakes in their life, I hear this from them. He says, I know God has forgiven me, but I cannot forgive myself. Whenever I hear that statement, I feel the pain, I feel the anguish, because if they cannot forgive themselves, then who can? If you are not able to forgive yourself, it is not because of the greatness of your sin. If you cannot forgive yourself, is you fail to f- understand the greatness of God's mercies. When you put the greatness of sin together with the mercies of God, the mercies of God will dissolve the sin. Where sin abound, grace will abound even more. Amen? Receive and experience that forgiveness of God. Because if you know that God is such a merciful God, you'll be able to come to God even when you sin. What's the point of you being down after you sin? The most important thing to do after you sin is to pick yourself up and do the right thing. The most important thing is to repent and move forward rather than sit there and cry buckets, I'm so, oh no, I've done wrong, I've done wrong, I've done wrong. That's not going to help anyone. It's not going to help yourself. It's going to help the people around you. And so God says, come, let me help you. You know, when I understood what the father did for the prodigal son after the prodigal son sinned and came back to the father, that brought so much freedom to my own life because I know when I make mistakes, I can come quickly to God and God will forgive me and God will help me. And so when you have experienced that mercy and that forgiveness, when you understand the greatness of God's mercy and the richness of God's mercy, something will happen internally, internally. And as a result, out of your belly, out of your innermost being, will overflow in mercies to others. When that happens, forgiving others is not difficult, but it is easy. It is not hard. It is simple. And so, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, let us remind one another that we are all works in progress. We make mistakes. We will make mistakes. 
but let us show mercy to one another. Where do we start? By understanding the greatness, the riches of God's mercy to each and every one of us. And let that mercy motivate, develop, cause the mercy in us to overflow to others. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just want to give thanks and praise to you. Lord, I pray that this evening, you help us to understand how wonderful you are, how merciful you are, how rich, how great, how lavish your mercy is to each and every one of us. Father, it is impossible for us to understand it with our own wisdom and strength because we have never lived in that dimension before. But Father, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, grant us wisdom and revelation of this truth so that our lives will be totally transformed when we understand your acceptance and in the same way, we'll be able to accept those around us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as we leave this place, we pray for your blessing, your guidance, your presence, your power to go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.